And the reason why I ask people that during my speech is that if she pitched you her company, you know, it's just a pitch, but by telling that story right there, she'll create an emotional bond with you, and that'll create that element of, I support your company because I feel you. And that's one of the biggest things I tell my clients all the time, is like, find a way to emotionally connect with your audience. And you did a great job, by the way. Thank you. And so, I had up here a surprise for everybody today. Um, how many people here have heard of TED? Technology Entertainment Design? Great. And so, TED Talks are one of the most famous talks in the world. And if you haven't heard about them, they get like the world's leading innovators, inventors, entrepreneurs, designers, musicians, dancers, crazy stuff. But they're always great presentations. And if you notice in these TED Talks, they usually open up with a story. And by opening up with a story, the, the speaker finds that rapport with the audience, finds that emotional connection with them. And if you go to our website today, or our blog website, www.hookyouraudience.com, there's a special blog post about Innovate today where we took two TED speakers and broke down their presentation and said, how do their stories affect the rest of the presentation? And by doing so, we had uh, Sir Ken Robinson in TED, and we also had the Stanford commencement speech with Steve Jobs. And so you can take a look at how those presentations were crafted and what makes them so great. So that ends our little portion on storytelling. Now, the next part is actually slide design. But I can actually tell you all a little bit about making proper slides um, through our experience, of course. Um, here's a quote. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And that's by Leonardo da Vinci. And the thing is, I'm a true believer when it comes to slides, you gotta keep it simple. Am I right? Like, have you seen those slides with like hundreds of texts? Probably in college, you're just thinking like, oh my God, when's this over? Like, we've seen it so many times. And here's the bad news. When you go out to the real world, I learned, it's still just as bad or even worse. And so, there's a principle me and my designers live by. And have you ever heard about this principle called KISS? Yeah. Keep it simple, stupid? Yeah. Please do that. And it's, a, it's actually invented by an engineer named Kelly Johnson way back when, I think in the 1950s, working on a bomber. And it actually was saying, all your engineering principles should be very simple and easy to understand. And we apply the same thing in our design. And so I was going to talk about this, sec this segment on, let's say this. I had a slide up here. And you know, imagine it. <laughs> all right. OK, so yeah, this is the best part. It's only going to get better. And so the market size for Big Fish presentations is that there are 30 million presentations given each day. And so we're a really big company. It has a really good market potential. That's what the slide said. And I see so many of these slides. And the thing is, if you're a presenter and you know your material, you can simplify it by just saying there are 30 million presentations given each day. Boom, rock solid right there. And by doing so, not only do you simplify the message, you simplify a way where the audience can understand you. And one of, the, one of the guys that did this the best was actually the Apple former CEO, Steve Jobs. And if you remember in his presentations, you can watch how clean they are and how each of them had almost less than 30 words a slide. But yet he was one of the best speakers in the world because he can do this because he focused on the imagery. And the reason why Steve Jobs was so good was because, one, he rehearsed his presentation religiously, but also, two, he wanted to be the one to tell you why he's so excited. He didn't want that slide up there to be the one to tell you what's going to happen next at Apple. And by doing so, he found a way to keep it simple, keep the slides simple. He was the presentation. And so the bottom line with that one is that presentations aren't meant to be crutches. They're meant to be visual aids. So practice your presentation. Now the next part, just imagine it's up there again, is use more imagery in your presentations. There's actually a psychological effect that we apply to some of our stuff, and we see it quite frequently out in, um, in TED Talks. It's called the picture superiority effect. And what that means is audiences, and they test this, they're more likely to remember the material if you have an image up there and you're talking about it. But I'm, I believe, what if you com combine both? 
What if you had a relevant image of what you're talking about and had simplistic messaging up there? And so this is what we had. We had an image of a donut. I'm not joking, on the right. And tons of bullet points. And while you might be able to say, oh, the bullet points, you know, they totally make everything better, it doesn't. If you have four paragraphs and bullet points, it's still going to be cluttered no matter what you say. And so we took that whole slide and just simplified that message into donuts are awesome. And, but that's the thing, like, you know, if you know your presentation, you'll be able to deliver it. And you can leave what's on the screen, what really needs to be on the screen. And, but there are three things, though, when it comes to designing slides that tell everyone they definitely should not do. With the first one being, use high-res images, please. Second one, no more clip art. Seriously. I mean, PowerPoint's been around so long, the chances are someone's seen it before. You're not original. And the third, and this one is usually the most shocking to other people, is less stock photos. And the reason why I say that is that people buy from people. And I cannot tell you how many times I've seen in a presentation where they took a picture of their executive team. And it's a bunch of people that's like multicultural, diverse. I was like, who is that guy? He's like, oh, that's actually not part of our team. I was like, oh my God, really? And so I had a really funny image up here of my team. You know, and the thing is, like, when I present, I'm not afraid to show them who we are. You know, be personal. People buy from people. You know, if you're going to show a generic slide up there and they ask you that awkward question, you're going to lie to them? You know, be honest. Remember, it's very important that you remember that principle that people buy from people because at the end of the day, your presentation is going to sell them. You're going to sell them. Third point, and this one, I had a funny slide up here, or I thought it was funny, was please ease up on those transitions and animations. You've seen it, you know, like the one I did, it actually hurt my pride literally to design it because it was spinning around, flying in and everything, and it actually literally the words caught on fire. And like my designer's like, did you really do this? I'm like, no, 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 I did it on purpose. They're like, oh my God, thank God, I was about to quit. And like... <laughs> And so the thing is, with our research and with what we've seen in the field today with the leading innovative presentations, one to three transitions max, actually, of like sliding in. And it's not like you know, spinning the screen around. It's just simple slide-ins because you're not there to bring the audience on a roller coaster ride. You're there to deliver your message. Now, the thing with animations and you know what I'm talking about when like, you know, the words slowly just creep up on the screen, kind of spin around a little bit, that kind of stuff. Keep it simple. You know, they're not there to watch that. You know, they can do it themselves. They're there to learn from you. And so our uh, recommendation of that is keep it very fast, simple, and just boom, just a little list like that. Or you have a bullet point list, you know, just boom, one bullet point, two, three, four, five. Keep it very simple. And it's because it's very important to remember that audiences will always remember the presenter more than the presentation. And so, I'm really excited to talk about the third point now. And the quote from Oprah is, do what excites you, passion will ignite you. And that's a quote by Oprah Winfrey. And that leads to the third point of my presentation, is that have fun while you're presenting, please. Because if you're up there, bad body language, just slouching and all that, we've all seen it, you know, at least act excited. And the thing is, it's, is it wrong to have fun while you're presenting? No, because if you don't believe in what you're presenting, what makes the audience believe in you? And it's also very important to remember, though, with passion, it's, I have to slide up there, I don't know if I can show it, but... There's three things that audiences look for in a presentation. And it's, it's actually a psychological rule by, by uh, Albert Mayer Bryan called the 38, 55, and 7% rule. And get this. Research states that 38% of people judge a presentation by verbal tone. 7% judge it by what's actually said. With that large chunk of 55%, is judged on body language, with facial recognition or fa facial expression being the most important, a smile. And when I heard this, it was unbelievable. But then I started seeing it in the field, going to presentations, watching it. People that are excited to present, smiling, introducing themselves, having fun, animated. 
they literally got the most attention from the crowd. And so it's really important for our clients to remember, and for any of your presentations, is that when you're up there, be excited when you present, please, because the audience will believe in you then. And so I'd like to kind of uh, end this presentation with a little story, too, though, and kind of like switch back on why I am an entrepreneur and tell you a little bit about my entrepreneurial journey and my failures, too, doing what I do. And so in high school, I was not the best of students. My friend Marilyn actually went to high school with me, and she can attest for that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. I thought you were going to save me on that one. That's cool. But uh, I remember I always wanted to be a chef. And not only that, I remember I was also very involved in a very bad group of people during that time. And by getting away from that, I formed a culinary, a culinary club at my high school. And I remember I had an opportunity to get a $25,000 scholarship to go to uh, NYC or Texas to go to culinary school. And I missed, I missed it. And it was a terrible feeling. I never, I never will forget being in high school and graduation. My dad walked up to me and said, wow, you have nothing to bring home or show me? And that really hit me really hard. And I sat back and I thought to myself, I don't really know what I want to do. I'm kind of screwed right now. And I need to get the bad elements out of my life. And I remember asking him, saying, I need to get out of the country. I need to go. And so I went to Vietnam. Now, I don't want to freak anyone out here, but my dad did something just out of the blue. He went to go see a psychic, just to see what would happen if Kenny went to Vietnam. Just, you know, kind of for fun. And I kid you not, this is what happened. And I didn't know about it. The psychic said, your son's going to be crying when he gets to your, your mother's grave. And my dad was like, what a, what a cry baby. And like, I was like, thanks, Dad, later when he told me. But he was like, why is that? And he said, and she told him, which I'm not going to tell you yet. My dad was very freaked out. It was like, there was just no way. That was just out of the blue stuff. And so my dad didn't tell me until we got to Vietnam. And it was an awesome trip. And I'll never forget my dad coming up to me and said, hey, let's go uh, visit your grandmother's grave. This is the first time I'm visiting it. Now, I remember walking up there. Austin, boom, tears comes flowing down. I'm freaked out here. I'm thinking I'm possessed or something, and I don't know what's going on. But the thing is, though, I wasn't crying in a sense where it was, I'm sad. I was having a casual conversation from you and I, and it was a totally normal one, but imagine tears flowing down my eyes, looking like a big crybaby. And my dad walked up to me and said, hey, son, I don't want to freak you out here, but those aren't your tears. Those are your grandmother's tears. Wow, I'm kind of freaked out right now, not even joking. And so I said, Dad, wow, what does this mean? He said, I don't know. And I told him, I want to spend the night in the house that you were raised at. I want to see what, what could possibly happen. You know, just to see, like, you know, if for some reason my grandma and grandfather visited me in a dream. Kind of made fun of that, big mistake. Anyway, so kind of like this, you know, big mistake made fun of that. And so <laughs> what happened with that was I remember spending a night, and in my dream, a very young lady and a, and a young gentleman walked up to me, very handsome, very beautiful lady. And I remember they, they talked to me, and I told the young man, it's like, dude, I talked to you all my life. Let me talk to this lady. Nice to meet you. For some reason, I felt like I instinctively knew who it was, but I didn't in the dream. And I remember her telling me, Kim, which is my Vietnamese name, you got to go back to America and be a leader. You've got to do something. You've got to do something that can impact each other's lives. You've got to find a calling. Stop screwing around. And it really hit me. And I said, well, wh what should I do? She, and she said, I don't have that much time. But you've got to find it yourself. I love you. And boom, woke up. Freaked out. And so I realized it was my grandmother. Because I described her to my dad. And my dad's like, oh, my God, that's so freaky. It's your grandma. And I took just from that little, that little experience that it's time to come back to America and do something that I love. Not only that, do something that can change other people's lives. And so from that trip, I learned three things. One, it was a blessing that I missed that competition. Number two, it was a blessing that 
I got to embrace my cultural heritage. And number three, like all entrepreneurs were very stubborn because it took a supernatural experience to tell me that I was pretty stupid. I needed to change my life. And so I took those three things and I came back to America and always wanted to find my calling then. And so I formed the entrepreneurial organization because I felt like there was a need for students to step up. But I still didn't know what I wanted to do. I still didn't know. And so I'll never forget two things happened. First was I failed my first business. I had a business where I had a projector screen sitting right here. Imagine this, a projector screen right here and a Wii controller hooked up to it and an infrared pen. And I could turn any projected surface into a smart board. Pretty cool, I'm not going to lie. I couldn't sell it though because it's a commodity. People didn't see the value in that and I failed. The thing was though, people always said, you always gave great presentations. It didn't really hit me. It hit me that night when I went to the Student Real Estate Association and saw that bad presentation, and I realized that that might be my calling. I've always had experience speaking in front of people, and you know, I never got really nervous at doing it, and today I have so much fun doing it. And so I, need, I knew I needed to, have to find a team. And today, we have a team of seven people in our office, all college undergrads, and we do work with a lot of awesome clients. And you know, I love speaking to college students, saying that you gotta find your calling. Any entrepreneur, too. You gotta find your calling, do what you love to do, because the feeling I get to have when I go to work is that I'm not really working. I'm doing what I love. I'm living my passion. I get to travel. I get to meet the coolest people. I mean, I met, I spoke after Mike DeLazer, the founder of Redbox, a couple months ago. And so, you know, I never thought I would get the experience like that by doing what I do. And so, I have a quote that I read the other day that actually tied in not only presentations, but the whole subject of entrepreneurship that really impacted me. And I'd like to close this presentation with that quote. People will always remember, will, will never forget, no, no. People, it's usually on there, don't blame me, you know. <laughs> People will forget what you said. People will forget what you do. But people will never forget how you made them feel. And if you incorporate that into your next presentation or your venture, I promise you, you're going to wow that audience. Thank you.